This is a Renegade Media Network podcast. I got to tell you guys about Zippix nicotine toothpicks. They're flavored toothpicks with nicotine in each one. I want to tell you about them because you might have heard them advertised now on some other podcasts because their name is getting out there. Let me tell you this little fact. This was the first podcast that they ever advertised on, and that is because I actually reached out to them. I already used this product, and I thought I might as well advertise for them. That's how much I like them, and I still use them all the time. They're flavored toothpicks, like I said, with nicotine in each one. Check out the flavors. Peppermint, watermelon, excellent. They've got the old school cinnamon. Remember the cinnamon toothpicks you would have as a kid? This is basically the adult version. They've got sweet whiskey, sweet wood. They've got mocha, spice, island clove. Very, very good as well. So basically, if you're trying to kick a bad habit, maybe go for the cheapest alternative on the market. That would be Zipix Toothpicks over at zipixtoothpicks.com. And of course, they want to support this show. And so do you. And if you want to buy some of these toothpicks, that helps this show out. So promo code buck at checkout buck gets you 20% off of your order that is 20% off when you enter promo code buck buck at zippixtoothpicks.com let's get to the show you are now listening to the counterflow podcast a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions you get split in fucking half cuz i call on the hologram graph but i am the center inside the placenta of math you clash with science Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to another episode of the Counterflow Podcast. What an honor it was to be on the unregistered podcast with Thaddeus Russell last week. I am sure some of you guys are aware that I was doing that. And Thaddeus, of course, is the owner of the Renegade Media Network, which this podcast is a part of. And we have been reaching an growing a nice size audience. And I'm, I've been happy with it over the last few years. But, you know, Thaddeus is one of the giants in our circles, we can say. And it was neat to be on a show that reaches a massive size audience like that. So I can only assume, I hope it's a safe assumption that we've got some new listeners now. And what a week to come aboard, because I'm bringing you one of my favorite guests, Daniel McCarthy. And I'll tell you, why he's on this show here in just a second. This is not an ad, so you don't have to fast forward because I'm about to say, but first let me tell you about, but it's not an ad. It's just me talking about the YouTube channel for this show because it's slowly growing. It's certainly not not the uh, reach that the normal podcast is. And that is because the last few years, I didn't really put much into the YouTube channel. When the show was called Death to Tyrants, all that would happen is every episode would pop to the YouTube channel but it was just the still screenshot of the old artwork. And now with the Counterflow podcast, all of these are videos on our YouTube channel, every interview, just about, including this one today with Daniel McCarthy. You can go to the YouTube channel and watch this if that's how you do things. Obviously, you just search Counterflow with Buck Johnson. You will find us there. But we have been doing something even better lately, and that is live streaming. I've done a few already, and I will continue to do them at least once a week is my goal And when we live stream on YouTube, that does not go to the podcast feed. It only stays on the YouTube channel. So if you're interested in extra content, you can go there. My first one was with my friend Matt Erickson of the King Pilled show on YouTube. We had a pretty fiery discussion. It was very enjoyable. I think you guys will dig it. My second one was with Tho Bishop, my pal over in the free state of Florida. And the thing with Tho we will be doing a series where he reads from the Rothbard Rockwell Report, the great paleo writings, paleo libertarian writings of the 90s. Tho is uh, bringing that back into, it's like a rebirth for it. He's, he's reprinting every issue of the Rothbard Rockwell Report. We will be doing a series where we read from them and discuss them and kind of bring some of the more interesting points that they made back in those issues and explain why they're relevant today and what they mean and and what they meant back then. Anyway, it's a very good time. It's really informative. We've got some great feedback. I've got good feedback from the Matt Erickson live stream and the Tho Bishop one already. So my point is, 
go subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll get notified when we do these live streams. So let's get to my guest today, Daniel McCarthy. First, I got to tell you why we're doing this episode with him. Not just because I love talking to him, I always do, but Daniel McCarthy is going to be, we can call him the professor, the instructor for a five-part live webinar on conservatism. This will be at Renegade University. Obviously, you know where to find that. Just type in Renegade University in the Google machine or DuckDuckGo, as I prefer, and you will find Renegade University, obviously run by Thaddeus Russell himself. Daniel McCarthy, like I said, is doing a five-part webinar on conservatism. This will be Tuesdays, June 29th, July 6th, 13th, 20th, and 27th, all starting at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, 8.30 Eastern Time. So once you register for this class, I do have to tell you, I'll be there, I think most of them live. And they're really cool if you've not done this yet. You can see everyone's faces. You, you, if you're shy, you don't have to show your face. You know it's a Zoom thing, so you can have your camera off. But it is neat to see uh, friends out there and about in, a, in the uh, virtual classroom. You don't have to do the class live. If you're busy for whatever reason on a Tuesday evening, you can do the class the next day once you register. So just wanted to throw that out there. I highly recommend Renegade University broadly. And I can tell you, after this discussion, I think you will be very tempted to take the course on conservatism by Daniel McCarthy. Let's just jump into it. Let me tell you really quickly about Daniel McCarthy. Let's get to his bio here. He's the editor of Modern Age, an American conservative academic quarterly journal. As a side note, I highly recommend it. I subscribe to only a few actual magazines. That is one of them. And I look forward to getting it and reading it every time. You know, it's, it's like a kid when you get a present in the mail, well, this that's kind of what I feel like when I get modern age. Previously, he was the editor at large of the American Conservative from 2010 through 2016. I am excited to have him here on the show. Daniel McCarthy, welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. I, I say welcome back. This might be the first time you've been on since uh, the rebrand, but uh, whatever the case is, I, I always love having you on. Uh, I want to discuss a, a five-part webinar series that you're teaching soon coming up on Renegade University with Thaddeus Russell, and I'm stoked for this class. Uh, uh, as soon as I saw it, I, I said to Thad, I've got to interview Daniel for this. This is, this is my wheelhouse. This is the stuff I love talking about, so I'm glad to have you here. Before we get into it, for those listening that are saying, well, who is this Daniel McCarthy guy? For one, shame on you guys for not knowing. But for the few out there who are asking that, kind of give them what you do. And, and if they're saying, well, what are his credentials to, to teach a five-part webinar series on conservatism? Uh, tell them that as well. Yeah, probably the easiest credential is that I uh, used to be the editor of a magazine called The American Conservative. Uh, I actually you know, got started as a uh, cub journalist, uh, as a, uh, a news reporter for them back uh, around the time of the Iraq war in 2003. And uh, I rose up the ranks and became the editor in chief uh, from uh, 2010 until 2016. And since then I've become the editor of Modern Age, which is a, a quarterly publication that uh, has been around uh, since the 1950s. It was founded by Russell Kirk, who was the guy who wrote the book called The Conservative Mind. And so uh, in some ways I'm the uh, sort of uh, the keeper of the legacy of this conservative tradition that Kirk uh, started to articulate going back, uh, you know, to the, uh, the Eisenhower years. And uh, then intellectually, you know, I've just been someone who has been engaged in the conservative war of ideas, uh, you know, going back to my college and undergraduate days, uh, even back to my high school days, perhaps. And, uh, you know, I have experience when, you know, with things ranging from uh, being part of a uh, publishing operation at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, where I was a senior editor there, to uh, working as the official uh, campaign blogger for the uh, Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign. So I'm someone who has experience with a lot of different facets of uh, American conservatism, whether it's some of the more libertarian uh, material or some of the more traditionalist and uh, sort of other directions of it. It's funny. I, I always, I hear people like you specifically, and then there are some others, and I associate it with, well, this guy's like a real conservative, you know, and he's not one of these George Bush types, but the the, the term conservative has been bastardized, we could say. It's been thrown about and incorrectly, I would say, throughout the years. And then 
I find people like you and I think, well, this is what it means to me. And I, I, I appreciate also that you've got experience with someone like Ron Paul on that, campa- on that campaign because in 2007, I guess, when I read that he was going to run for president on the re- under the Republican banner, I thought he's going to get elected. He's the real deal. He's a real conservative. And, and surely the Republicans are going to go for this guy. And huh, I, I learned quickly that was not the case. It, do you think the term conservative gets used incorrectly quite a bit? Well, sure, but all of these political terms uh, get used uh, incorrectly. So, um, you know, you'll see terms like liberal and libertarian, obviously, are very contentious as well. Uh, Socialist, you know, the Republicans think that uh, everyone's a socialist. Uh, Bernie Sanders has a a more narrow definition. Uh, Postmodernist, which is another one of these terms that uh, comes up uh, that Renegade University has addressed. Uh, You know, there are any number of people have a prejudicial view of what postmodernism means or who have, you know, a very narrow definition all of these terms, um, you should just kind of take them for what they are, and you should use them as, you know, a sort of uh, rough guide, perhaps, to uh, the, you know, sort of political environment or to an intellectual world. But you should not invest them with so much importance that you get hung up on them and that the term itself becomes more important than the ideas behind the term. Well, let's start with, with the class, and I want to get into the weeds for sure, and there's a lot of territory I, I, I'd like to cover, but let's kind of get an overview of, of what you will be teaching in the five-part uh, webinar series. Yeah, the five parts are uh, partly chronological, but also partly thematic as well. And what I want to do is to make the course appropriate both for the 101 level for people who are just coming to conservatism for the first time and want to see what it means as a serious intellectual tradition. But also I want it to work for people who are at the 300 or 400 course level who want to get something more than just the uh, normie platitudes and just the general sort of uh, introductory picture of what conservatism might be. So these five uh, you know, lectures of mine are going to address uh, different topics, and they're going to combine both the sort of uh, uh, conventional view with the more advanced, uh, perhaps esoteric perspective as well. So we'll start out by talking about, uh, first of all, why Americans started to think of the word, word conservative as something that applies to themselves uh, after World War II. Why did you have a book like The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk in 1953 become a, uh, a bestseller of sorts? Uh, it, you know, it's this heavy, you know, 400, 500 page book. Uh, even back in the 50s, it was not the kind of thing that was bedside reading for most people. And yet there was this sudden appetite in the country for some reason uh, for this uh, brand of conservatism and for the idea of conservatism. Why was that? Well, I'm going to argue that in part it's because of the crisis that the whole of Western civilization and the whole world, in fact, encountered after, uh, you know, the uh, Second World War. So you have, you know, not only do you have, you know, Nazism, totalitarianism, the Holocaust and all of that, but of course, even the victorious good guys in World War II are dropping the atomic bomb and obliterating, you know, a lot of Japanese civilians. We had firebombings, you know, against Dresden and Germany. We had uh, various kinds of ethnic cleansing and population removals going on, being perpetrated by allies and being perpetrated by the Soviets, as well as by Nazi Germany. So there was a sense that all of civilization, and not just the evil forces that had been fought against in World War II, was really indicted and thrown into crisis by the war. And that's why I think you see such a strong conservative revival happen after World War II. And uh, so the first course will, will begin with that. But then we'll start uh, going backwards to the 18th century and looking at this guy named Edmund Burke, who is this um, Irish-born uh, member of the UK Parliament, member of the English Parliament, who is uh, you know, often seen as the founder of classical conservatism back in the 18th century. And uh, Burke is someone who understood the irrational side of human nature and why it's important to have institutions and traditions that are able to take the ineradicable irrationality of human beings and channeled it into a more civilized direction as opposed to um, having people uh, you know, become so hubristic in their, their uh, intellectual uh, views of the world that they wind up tearing down everything that exists because they think they can rebuild it better. And that's kind of the, the basic hubris of everything that conservatism opposes ideologically. It's this idea that you can level reality, level the world, and then build back better, as uh, Joe <laughs> Biden liked to say. And, uh, you know, the beginning of my course will be saying that uh, there's a reason why conservatives are skeptical of that kind of leveling, why they're skeptical of intellectual scams to try to completely re, uh, you know, redesign the, the human, human life itself. 
uh, let alone the political order and everything else. And then from there, I'll go on the rest of the uh, the uh, lectures, the the, all, the five of them in total. We'll be looking at uh, different varieties of conservatism. I'll start out by uh, looking at some of the 19th century developments in the direction of a, a kind of individualist, almost libertarian conservatism, but it's still very conservative because it has a focus on the idea that liberty comes from an aristocratic ethos. It's not a form of egalitarianism. It's not a form of democracy. It, in fact, has something to do with the older uh, European traditions of nobility and the intellectual sort of echoes of them that survive into the 19th century. Uh, then a subsequent lecture, we'll talk about mocked politic or the idea of power politics, that uh, sometimes the world is not a choice between good and evil. In fact, oftentimes it's a choice between different degrees of evil and that power is necessary to contradict power. And that's a very Machiavellian kind of conservatism that is represented by someone like James Burnham. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's an element of it even in neoconservatism or perhaps particularly in neoconservatism. And I'll talk about, you know, sort of the, the contradictions in neoconservatism between uh, their quasi-realistic elements and then their more idealistic and utopian elements and how that gets us into a lot of trouble, uh, you know, in the George W. Bush years. I'll also uh, be covering uh, a bit of Southern conservatism, uh, a much demonized and much misunderstood phenomenon, and talking about uh, why con conceptions like honor and local community are, in fact, important, uh, not just to, to conservatives, but to everyone. And then I'll wrap up the course by talking about uh, the challenge uh, that is currently before the country, which is, is Americanism and conservatism, are these things compatible? And uh, on the one hand, you, of course, see a lot of progressives saying uh, conservatism is fundamentally fascistic, it's fundamentally un-American, it's anti-enlightenment, you can't be an American and be a conservative today. And on the other hand, you find a number of conservatives who are saying, well, actually, you know what, all of modernity is a big mistake. We need to go back either to the classical world, to Aristotle and Plato, or else go back to the Middle Ages into a kind of, uh, you know, sort of Catholic uh, world order. And that, uh, therefore, yeah, Americanism and conservatism are incompatible. And that's a good thing, some of these folks would say. So I'll be, you know, looking at both of those arguments and uh, maybe offering a few of my own at the uh, conclusion of the course. Did you put this together for Renegade University, or is this something you presented uh, in the past? It really is for Renegade University. You know, it's uh, a lot of themes I've been thinking about for a while, and this is my opportunity to put them all into one package and uh, see what kind of audience responds. Well, I, I want to get uh, to some some definitions. And this, this is going to be helpful to me as much as the audience, because I, I want to make sure when I discuss these things that I'm, I'm correct. Can you explain what it means to be right-wing or um, of the right and, and is there a relationship strictly between right wing and conservative, or is there some kind of variance in there where it, one might not be the other? Yeah, I think uh, for the most part, it's a good idea to keep the idea of conservative and right wing uh, somewhat separate, and they tend to overlap. But to be right wing is to reject whatever the left happens to be doing at a given point in time. And uh, so anti leftism is what it means to be right wing, I think. Whereas conservatism, uh, there may actually be situations in which conservatism, uh, you know, finds the left to be less dangerous than certain revolutionary kinds of right-wing sentiment. Um, so conservatism is, you know, a defense of what might be called uh, prejudice in the broad sense of the term. That is, uh, conservatism is defending the idea that we don't have to rearrange our social order and our lives uh, whenever some bright new idea comes along and says that it's got a better way of doing everything. Um, but of course, those kinds of revolutionary ideas sometimes are coming from people who may be on the right, that is reacting against the left, just as they might be coming from people on the left who, you know, are fighting and, you know, uh, promoting ideas of radical egalitarianism or what have you. It, then is right wing in your mind strictly reactionary? Right wing and reactionary are, you know, terms that tend to go together quite well, although not always, right? So on the one hand, you could be a right wing reactionary. I think that would be a fair description if you believed you could tear down the existing order and go back to a previous order. I think that would be a reactionary point of view. On the other hand, you can also have revolutionary right wing views. And of course, you know, you see a kind of um, a casual discussion about movements like fascism, which say, well, you know, fascism, Mussolini started out as a socialist, uh, national socialism in Germany, hey, they were socialists, therefore they were of the left. But in fact, both Hitler and Mussolini were reacting very strongly against communists um, and against socialists. So there is a sense in which those movements actually were right-wing. And the word right-wing doesn't mean that it's a good thing, certainly not. 
And uh, But it also doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing as it's applied to other movements that might be opposed to the French Revolution or what have you. Right. And similarly, the word conservative doesn't necessarily mean that uh, something that's conservative is good. And I think that's one of the virtues of uh, you know putting some distance between these political labels and mm-hmm. one's own values. Uh, you shouldn't simply take a label and say, hey, whatever gets packaged under this label is therefore going to be uh, healthy for you. Uh, it may actually be that the package is you know, sometimes appropriate and sometimes not. And so conservatism uh, has its limitations. And there are times when conservatism might be the wrong approach to uh, a crisis, for example, or to you know, a, a grave injustice. But for the most part, I think conservatism is a pretty sound approach. And uh, that's one reason why I'm going to make a case for it in this course. Okay. Maybe you, you, you can tell me where I'm wrong in this statement. I, I have often said that right wing equals, let's say, a respect or, yeah, let's say a respect for hierarchy, natural hierarchy and an order. And left wing equals a, a lust or a respect for or a yearning for egalitarianism. Yeah, I don't think that's wrong, although, you know, it does fit the pattern I've just discussed, right? So if the left-wing idea is egalitarianism, and I think that generally is the case, then if the right-wing idea is opposed to that and is a sense of hierarchy, the question becomes what kind of hierarchy? Mm-hmm. Is it a racial hierarchy, which it was for you know the, the Nazis, of course? Is it a hierarchy of aristocratic birth, which it was you know in uh, you know much of the uh, uh, feudal Europe and thereafter? Uh, Is it a hierarchy of some other kind? Is it a hierarchy of sort of uh, achievement, meritocratic hierarchy? There are lots of different kinds of hierarchies, and therefore you get a lot of different kinds of right-wing perspectives. But I think you're correct that anything that's right-wing is generally going to be quite skeptical of uh, the sort of radical egalitarianism that you find characteristic of the left. I want to tell you guys about the official coffee of the Counterflow podcast, and that is Lorenzotti Coffee over at lorenzotti.coffee. I don't really want to specifically tell you about them because I drink it every morning, because I love it, because it's directly imported from Italy. It's in these vacuum sealed packs. It's in these beautiful tins that look very good on your kitchen counter. Those aren't really the reasons I want to tell you about them. The real reason is because in this day and age with all of the insanity going on, I think it's nice to be able to have companies that are very like-minded that we can support. And that's very helpful. You know, everyone's scared now, like, should I support this company? I don't know. Are they crazy? Well, I can tell you, the guys at Lorenzotti.coffee are really good guys. They're like-minded individuals, and they want to support shows like mine that you listen to. So I think if they're willing to give me a cut of the money coming into them from you guys, that should uh, make you want to support them. You like this show? You want to support like-minded companies? Well, here's one for you, Lorenzotti Coffee over at L-O-R-E-N-Z-O-T-T-I dot coffee. I'll tell you one thing. If you type in promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K, at checkout, you will get 10% off of your order. You'll be supporting a very good company. The coffee is amazing, and it helps me out too. So if you like this show, give it some support. Now back to the show. When I, I posted a tweet uh, discussing that I would be interviewing you and and about this class that's coming up at Renegade University. Uh, my friend Stefan Kinsella, who's well known in the uh, let's say anarcho capitalist uh, world, and he's very he's known for his anti intellectual property stance and writings. He said something under the tweet that conservatism is utterly incoherent and inca- excuse me incompatible with liberty. What are you, what's your response to something like that? I think he's got it exactly backwards, right? Because if you have a coherent ideological system and you're going to apply that, you know, in any situation, that's actually going to be antithetical to liberty. I think real liberty is complex and therefore it can't be reduced to a simple rule. It can't be reduced to a kind of utopian scheme of property rights or anything else. And that's, I think, one of the core, uh, you know, important um, insights of conservatism that you can't have one very simple rule like uh, John Stuart Mill's harm principle or any other one simple rule, whether it's you know egalitarianism or any kind of abstraction, and simply say that all of human life can be reduced to that, all of politics can be reduced to that, and that um, you know then you are going to make for a much happier and better world. Um, so you know I, I think Stefan Kinsella's arguments against intellectual property are very valuable, um, although I don't totally agree with them. I should say. I mean, my view 
uh, is that all property is more or less conventional. And that's true for intellectual property. It's also true of physical property. And this is contrary to the, you know, sort of quasi Lockean view that you get from, I think, some of Stefan Kinsella's friends. I don't know if Stefan himself would fall into this category, where they think that there is a kind of natural, uh, you know, sort of property that can emerge without any kind of agreement among people, or that the agreement is kind of secondary to the, the natural logic of the thing. And uh, I'm much more skeptical of that. I think that property is, you know, that people agree on what property is. And if they don't agree on what property is, then it's very hard to, you know, just say that you have some sort of clear idea that is going to resolve the dispute. You just have a dispute that's going to be irresolvable until people wind up using force to resolve it. Well, where do you stand on, and you might bring this up in the class as well, on, the, on Locke's natural rights theory? Well, it's a big question. Um, you know, I, I think there's some truth to those who believe that Locke is a little bit closer to Thomas Hobbes than we think. Um, but you can also flip that around. You can say that Hobbes is a little closer to John Locke than we think. And that Hobbes, in fact, is, uh, even though the commercial society is not the primary thing he's aiming at, uh, that Hobbes is, in fact, creating a kind of political order that is quite beneficial and quite open to the commercial society. Uh, one of the things that the Leviathan does, after all, is to suppress all these other coercive elements which could be uh, getting in the way of commerce. And commerce does not necessarily interfere with the kinds of things that, uh, you know, that Leviathan is simply as a, you know, maintainer of rules. Uh, but Locke and, and Locke and natural rights, um, the thing I would say as a conservative is that there is a tradition for natural rights and a tradition for uh, a kind of contract view of the social order which in fact is much older than John Locke. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mayflower Compact, for example, is before John Locke. It's before Hobbes as well. And that uh, this idea that, uh, you know, sort of uh, Englishmen, that, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, for that matter, just people within the kind of law-based order that existed, uh, even at that point, uh, you know, in uh, Anglo-American society, that they have uh, this ability to come together and to create institutions when they are otherwise... Uh, not subjected to some authority. Um, this is it's a reasonable thing. So I'll talk a little bit about John Locke in my uh, you know my my course, but um, and I'll have to draw some distinctions between Locke perhaps and Edmund Burke. Mm -hmm. But I do think that that, the, that some of the polarized views of Locke, either sort of seeing him as the you know sort of Fonz at Origo, the origin of all bad stuff in America. I think that view is wrong, but I also think it's wrong to say that um, there would not be in America, there would not be uh, any kind of liberty without John Locke and his ideas. Let's talk about some of the various labels uh, that go along with conservatism. And, and so could you name some of those? Obviously, we know neoconservatism uh, and paleoconservatism, which I want to get to on its own, but some of the, the types of conservatism and maybe associate them with a name that the listeners might be familiar with? Yeah, so my uh, course will uh, take this on. And um, I guess we'll start with the ones you mentioned. So neoconservatism gets started in uh, the late 60s, 1970s, and then starts to take over the conservative movement in the 80s and the 90s, and then during the George W. Bush years. Neoconservatism starts out as, um, well, some of its you know progenitors, people like Irving Kristol, for example, mm -hmm actually have a background that goes all the way back to the Trotskyist, um, you know, sort of descent from Stalinist uh, communist politics. Um, but the neocons by the time of uh, the Johnson and the Nixon administrations, they are people who are basically, you know, kind of semi-reformed Lyndon Johnson Democrats. They are people who, they like the idea of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. They kind of like certain programs of uh, LBJ, especially the Vietnam War. But they don't necessarily like the uh, the welfare state as it has grown under the great society of LBJ. They think maybe you know that's going a little too far and is being detrimental to marriage, for example. And the neocons are also um, they really don't like the cultural leftism that the Democratic Party starts to incorporate at that point. So the neoconservatives uh, they they you know they don't like the idea that uh, black radicalism is on the rise and that uh, criticisms of Israel in particular are on the rise within the Democratic Party. And so they start shifting to uh, the, the middle and to the uh, Republican Party eventually. And they sort of, you know, semi-grudgingly support Nixon, and then they wind up becoming, uh, you know, supporters of certain Republican politicians thereafter, especially the Bush clan eventually. Um, the neocons start out, they're concerned with things like urban crime. Uh, in foreign policy, they think that um, 
a lot of Democrats are turning into wimps or actually becoming anti-American. So the neocons start out uh, having this, you know, perspective, which I think a lot of other right-wingers would share. Uh, however, uh, when you get to the 1990s and the 2000s, the Cold War is over, urban crime rates are starting to drop precipitously, and the neocons have kind of given up on the older sort of um, urban and foreign policy sort of uh, contestation view of uh, uh of their uh, points of view, the view of their their politics. They instead take on a very utopian Wilsonian view of what the U.S. can achieve in the world through the use of its power and creating basically uh, what George H.W. Bush called a new world order that would be liberal and democratic and capitalistic, while at the same time, domestically, uh, the neocons had always been somewhat more favorable towards uh, large-scale immigration than some of the older conservatives had been. Uh, the neocons are also, uh, they wind up becoming very strongly in favor of free trade agreements and so the neocons are the antithesis of what you see right now with the kind of Trump nationalist or populist kind of conservatism. And the Trump kind of conservatism actually has a lot in common with what was called paleoconservatism back in the 1990s. And the paleoconservatives were the opponents of the neocons. Uh, they were the people who looked at what the neocons were starting to do in the 1980s and said, wait a minute, uh, this is crazy. We need to get away from this. Pat Buchanan is probably the best known name that people would associate with paleoconservatism, but uh, intellectuals like Paul Gottfried and Sam Francis are also notable paleoconservatives. The paleos, uh, you know, they're they're an eclectic bunch. Some of them are kind of you know uh, southern agrarians. Some of them are um, you know sort of uh, tough-minded uh, you know power politics guys who look to Machiavelli and James Burnham and others. And uh, some of them are you know sort of strong Catholic traditionalists. But they all come together to oppose the neocons. And they tend to cluster around a set of views which are um, socially conservative, yes, but also characterized by um, skepticism about mass immigration, opposition to large to, to free trade agreements, and uh, opposition to an interventionist foreign policy. So again, you can see how they are kind of ancestral to what we now see as the, the Trump movement. Um, some of the other more um, esoteric or you know smaller but influential groups. Uh, that are also in the mix here include uh, the Straussians. They are followers of a, uh, an intellectual by the name of Leo Strauss, who um, Strauss was, um, I'll have to get into him in depth in the, uh, the course itself, but Strauss is, on the one hand, someone who made his mark as a reader of texts. He would take Machiavelli or he would take Locke and he would read them very carefully and find uh, subtle meanings within their texts that may have been missed by other readers. And this made uh, Strauss a very controversial figure because he would often find out that um, you know, what a classic author was saying might be rather different from what the popular image of his message was uh, supposed to be. And Strauss has a number of uh, influential followers, such as uh, Harry Jaffa, who becomes a leader of what's called a you know, West Coast Straussian uh, school of thought. Uh, Harry Jaffa is associated with uh, Claremont McKenna University for a long time. And uh, the Claremont Institute today is a representative of the continuation of Harry Jaffa's thought. Harry Jaffa, um, you know, is in particular someone who thinks that um, Abraham Lincoln uh, understood something fundamentally philosophical about uh, the clash between the South and the North in the uh, run-up to the Civil War. And Harry Jaffa thinks that Lincoln was uh, not just someone who took the Declaration of Independence and correctly understood the uh, fundamental rights that it outlines, but someone who uh, had a, uh, a kind of more expansive view of uh, the rights of the Declaration of Independence, perhaps than even uh, the authors of the document themselves did, and that this uh, sort of view of the Declaration of Independence is the, you know, the, the root of the American order, especially since uh, the days of Lincoln. So we'll get into uh, sort of some of the um, you know, conservative views about Lincoln, which are diverse. And some conservatives, yes, as you yes. might imagine, the Southern agrarians and others are quite critical of, uh, of Abraham Lincoln, whereas the uh, West Coast Straussians are very favorable. Then you also have East Coast Straussians who are identified with people like Alan Bloom and uh, Harvey Mansfield. And Harvey Mansfield has been a professor at, uh, at Harvard for a very long time, which means that a number of, of his students have gone on to be very influential intellectuals political leaders and journalists. So uh, Bill Kristol, for example, one of the princelings of the neoconservatives, uh, he is someone who is a, uh, a devoted, uh, you know, sort of um, student, uh, former student of Harvey Mansfield's. So I'll, we'll, we'll get into that as well a little bit. 
There are other groups as well. I mentioned uh, people who want to see a much stronger Catholic element brought to bear mm -hmm. in the American polity. And uh, the term they go by these days is integralist. They look back to some of the movements uh, in the run-up to World War II that uh, you know, wanted to see a more powerfully faith-based politics in Europe. And uh, it's kind of a tradition that you know, falls out of the uh, historical consciousness after World War II, but it's being revived now by a number of influential thinkers. Uh, they're a diverse lot, and I don't want to say that people like Adrian Vermeule on the one hand, maybe Patrick Deneen on the other, are necessarily identical in their points of view or that they're identical with any you know, sort of French thinker of the interwar period. But uh, that's the general sort of population that we're talking about. And uh, I'm sure there will be other um, sort of uh, factions that I'll cover. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about fusionists. They're the people who are sort of misunderstood as trying to um, artificially bridge conservatism and libertarianism, where in fact, uh, the argument that the real fusionists, people like Frank Meyer used to make, was that libertarianism and conservatism were both manifestations of a shared tradition that was much older. And uh, so I think you know, one of the things my course will do is to help people kind of uh, understand things they may interpret one way in a totally new light. It'll help to show kind of the real history and the real background of some of these terms which have been vulgarized or uh, you know, some of these traditions which have been misinterpreted more recently. And uh, then we'll also talk about you know, uh, people like Edmund Burke and the traditional conservatism, as it tends to be called, uh, that grows out of the Burkean tradition uh, when you get to the 20th century and thinkers like Russell Kirk. You mentioned the neoconservative tradition coming from the Trotskyite uh, lineage, we can say. Is the, is the imperial nature of, let's say, military bases all over the world that, that neocons would, would certainly be in favor of. Do you, do you think that's a leftist instinct to want something like that? Yeah, I do. But I think it's uh, fundamentally Wilsonian, perhaps even more mm -hmm. than it is uh, Trotskyite and a belief in a uh, permanent world revolution. But yes, I mean, you can see that this is one of the key things that um, conservatism, to the extent that it can be a serious thing, is meant to be opposed to. And that is uh, trying to restructure everything to take an existing situation that may be imperfect and say, hey, we can come in here, smash everything, and rebuild in a, uh, a much more perfect and a much better way. And uh, that's what neoconservatism wants to do around the world. It wants to demolish existing societies. Uh, you know, it, it looks at the Islamic world and it says, hey, wouldn't everyone be better off if they were liberal and democratic mm -hmm. and uh, you know, perhaps uh, so-called modern and so forth? And you know, maybe that's the case. Maybe that liberalism and democracy would be great. But in order to get there, in order to build liberalism and democracy, they first of all want to destroy everything that exists. And it turns out that destroying what exists uh, is not just a matter of toppling a dictator like Saddam Hussein. It winds, out, all, winds up also destroying the Christian communities that have existed in the Middle East since the time of Christ himself. So neoconservatism is a revolutionary movement at this point, and it is something that is a global revolutionary movement uh, in much the same spirit, if not in any practical way, uh, in much the same spirit as Trotskyism was. I'm fond of the paleoconservative tradition and, and then, of course, the paleo-libertarian movement of the 90s. Can you talk about how that kind of came about? I want people listening to understand not, not so much the Frank Meyer fusionism, but there was kind of in the 90s a Patrick Buchanan, Lou Rockwell, Murray Rothbard form of fu fusionism. Can you talk about that? There was. So the neocons uh, took over the right to such an um, absolute degree uh, by the late 1980s that they were able to basically dictate terms both to libertarians and to older traditionalists and older conservatives. And uh, this ticked off um, you know, both people who believed in a more radical view of the free market than the neocons were able to um, endorse. And that includes people like you know, uh, followers of Austrian economics, people who uh, were followers of Murray Rothbard in particular, and that includes Lou Rockwell. Uh, Ron Paul would be in that universe as well. And uh, then on the other side, you had uh, traditionalist conservatives, people like Pat Buchanan and Paul Gottfried and others, who uh, thought that the neocons were far too uh, supportive of open borders, far too supportive of multiculturalism. Even if the neocons wanted to uh, you know, have a more moderate form of multiculturalism than the radical left did, nevertheless, uh, people like Gottfried and Buchanan were very much uh, skeptical of what the neocons were trying to do. And uh, the great thing was that the uh, libertarians in the Rothbard circle 
they also hated political correctness. They also hated the thought control that uh, was going to be jointly exercised by uh, the neocons and by the left wing sort of you know center left liberal establishment. So think about this. I mean, these were these were days when the universities and uh, the neocons, the Bush administrations, especially the first Bush administration, when they were you know on a relatively close wavelength, and they you know even to the degree that they disagreed with one another, the universities were more radical. Nevertheless, they both came together and agreed, hey, we should jointly suppress anyone who is to our left or to our right. And that included Rothbardian libertarians. It included Buchananite conservatives. It included Ralph Naderite people on the left as well. It included a lot of left-wing critics of globalization uh, and of uh, the, the you know, sort of globalist uh, uh, foreign policy interventionism as well. And that was a key uh, unifying element because uh, the neocons and uh, the, the sort of Clintonite left of the 1990s, they all agreed on a sort of grand humanitarian project in foreign policy where we were going to bomb other countries into uh, becoming nice liberal democracies like Switzerland. And this was something that, of course, uh, libertarians rejected, uh, paleoconservatives rejected, and uh, you know, the more principled people on the left rejected as well. But Bill Clinton, you know, he was one of the people pushing this point of view. Uh, the people like you know, the Bushes and the Cheneys, they were also on board with this. And so you get different varieties of it, depending on whether it's a Democratic or Republican administration. But it is fundamentally the same imperialist you know, sort of attempt to reshape the world by American power. And of course, it's, 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 um, it's not really you know, as altruistic as its supporters make it out to be. Um, you know, the theory is, hey, you're going to turn Iraq into Switzerland. The practice is, um, hey, we're going to make sure that uh, we maintain our power by basically whitewashing our own, screwing over the American people by saying, well, sure, things at home might be kind of bad, but you know what? We're off on a really important crusade, and therefore you should support us. I mean, if you wanted to have a cynical interpretation of the crusades in the Middle Ages, and certainly some of them, like the Fourth Crusade, were extremely cynical, um, you could say, hey, that was the same kind of thing. That You take people and you say, instead of having these domestic disputes, you're just going to translate that into a, a really noble humanitarian or, you know, sort of um, highly moralistic uh, uh, use of force uh, far away from home, and that that is going to distract people from their discontents with the order that exists here. So uh, people like Murray Rothbard and Lou Rockwell, Ron Paul, uh, Pat Buchanan, um, Paul Gottfried, Sam Francis, and others, they all had a lot in common back in the uh, 1990s. And uh, they generally in common supported Pat Buchanan for president, or at least in the Republican Party back in 1992 in the primaries. And older conservatives like uh, Russell Kirk and Robert Nisbet were also supporting Buchanan at that point. So the 92 Buchanan campaign, and to a lesser extent the 96 campaign, they were both a dividing line for the American right. And on one side of that line, you had the neocons and the establishment. And on the other side of that line, you had basically all the good people. And that included the Rothbard libertarians. It included, uh, you know, sort of uh, traditionalists like Russell Kirk. And it included uh, paleoconservatives like Paul Gottfried. Was it Russell Kirk, I think, at some point that had some pretty harsh words for libertarians? <laughs> so Russell Kirk, uh, you know, didn't publish under his own name uh, some of the things that have uh, gotten out there. But yes, he did write a private letter, which someone else published, uh, saying that George H.W. Bush should be hanged on the uh, uh, the lawn in front of the White House uh, because of the, the first Gulf War. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the first Gulf War was kind of the, the symbol of this, you know, we're at the end of the Cold War, and yet the American, you know, sort of military industrial complex is not going to be dismantled. We're not going to become a normal country again. Instead, we're going to become the world's policemen. And you can't really be the kind of republic that, you know, these older conservatives uh, had admired. You can't be a republic and have this imperial uh, design uh, to go out there and remake the whole planet. So um, Kirk saw someone like George H.W. H. W. Bush uh, basically betraying the entire, you know, sort of American and conservative tradition. But did he not? I thought he had written something against libertarians at some point, too. Well, he had done that as well. And, okay. uh, you know, Kirk, especially earlier on in the 70s and 80s, was very critical of libertarians when they were connected with the counterculture. Okay. And uh, Kirk has a very funny line where he says, you know what? Uh, 
libertarians are just as radical as the old uh, sort of Bolsheviks and the old 19th century anarchists. But you know what? At least those 19th century anarchists knew which sex they were. They knew which gender they were. <laughs> right. And at the time, you know, for a long time, I thought, well, that's kind of a you know mean thing to say about libertarians. But to be honest, today, <laughs> yeah. a lot of libertarians would embrace that description. They yes. would say, no, we're proud of actually not being male or female. So Russell Kirk was perhaps descriptive rather than polemical. Yeah, and and to his defense, Murray Rothbard wrote some pretty similar criticisms of the libertarian movement, certainly within the libertarian party. Uh, with During the Paleo-Libertarian Alliance, when they were putting out the Rothbard-Rockwell report, uh, there's it's funny, you read those now, and there's a lot of elements where I'm going, I mean, he could, he could write this today, the, basically saying the Libertarian Party and the Beltway Libertarian movement at large is full of kind of lefty, uh, socially left people, for instance, that celebrate a trans parade and stuff like that, rather than getting back to traditional uh, conservative values while also being a libertarian. Yeah, but remember that, um, I mean, Rothbard is critiquing that. And in fact, not just Rothbard, but this is something that's true of conservatives like Kirk as well. The cr criticism is not just at the moral level. It's also at the level of the powers within our society. So the fact that corporate America and the fucking CIA, right? <laughs> they yes. are endorsing transgenderism. Yes. That tells you something about, you know, whether a transgenderism is a radical movement that is a danger to the power structure. No, it isn't. It is something that uh, at yeah. this point has been entirely co-opted and in fact is now being used as a weapon against uh, you know, the few institutions that might try to resist uh, you know, centralized power uh, being wielded by uh, basically our, our oligarchical overlords. So um, Murray Rothbard understood what had gone wrong with libertarianism because he lived through it. He lived <laughs> through uh, the counterculture period among libertarians. There's a great story where during the Vietnam era, uh, Rothbard is talking to a small group of libertarians and telling them about the nature of the state. He's telling them about the nature of economics. And uh, some of these libertarians, I forget whether Carl Hess was in the audience of that day or not, but they decide, hey, let's, let's stop listening to this stupid lecture. Let's just go out there and go to a U.S. military base. We'll cut our way through the, uh, the wire fence. We'll go in there. We'll lie down on the runway and we'll stop the planes from taking off. And Rothbard just thinks this is utterly stupid. I mean, what do you actually achieve here? So you go do this, you get arrested, you haven't actually stopped any train, uh, planes from taking off. And in the meantime, you've shown that you don't actually care about you know, ideas that want to critique power at a deep level, that you just want to go out there and basically make a spectacle out of yourself. And uh, that, I think, is a level at which Rothbard would certainly criticize a lot of libertarianism today. I mean, this was what, what's now called virtue signaling. Yes. And at the time, you know, at least you know, there was some risk involved in going out there and breaking into a U.S. military base, whereas today, being on Twitter and denouncing someone for wrong think, obviously there's no risk at all in doing that. And in fact, you get rewarded by the establishment for doing it. So Rothbard, uh, you know, it was not just that Rothbard was personally socially conservative. There's some truth to that. But it was also that he understood that a lot of this, um, you know, cultural leftism was in fact a kind of support for, for uh, you know, uh, the state and support for oligarchical power as opposed to being a threat to it. And among conservatives too. I mean, sometimes you might think that um, you just have this kind of stuffy, old-fashioned, moralistic uh, criticism being leveled against, uh, you know, sort of movements for liberalization of uh, social mores and so forth. But usually that is connected to something at a deeper level. So people like Robert Nisbet, for example, a great conservative sociologist of the 50s and, and onwards, they would talk about you know, how the family and the church are actually institutions that are able to resist state power. And once you start undermining these kinds of tightly knit uh, you know, other institutions, you wind up with a much more clear uh, field for state power to exercise itself. One of the great illustrations of this, by the way, and this goes to show how you know, a, a politically incorrect conservatism is actually very radical in a, in a way that I think a lot of real radicals should appreciate. Yes. But lately, in the last 30 years or so, there has been a movement to get government to criminalize something called marital rape. And as soon as you hear that, you think, well, of course, I mean, you know, rape is wrong. Rape is, you know, it has to be illegal, just as all other kinds of rape are illegal. Why wouldn't you criminalize marital rape? And Phyllis Schlafly, who was one of the major grassroots conservative activists of the 20th century, she opposed this completely. She said, absolutely not. No, you can't have these bills to criminalize marital rape. And you think, this is crazy. What, what was she saying, that rape is good or something? No, what she was saying is that, look, the whole nature of marriage is that it involves a sexual relationship that is ongoing between two people. 
And therefore, if you start to apply the same standards of sexual harassment or uh, inappropriate touching that would apply in the wider society within marriage, you're actually not only going to dissolve marriage, but you're creating an, an opportunity for the state to come in and start, you know, aggressively policing and adding its, you know, sort of biopolitics, to use a, a Foucauldian term, mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. uh, the family unit itself, right? So Phyllis Schlafly and uh, Foucault would seem to be at very opposite ends of things, but I think they would both see that there is a danger when you start to say that, um, you know, something that seemingly sounds like a, an unproblematic idea, like criminalizing marital rape, uh, turns out to be just simply a way for the state and other institutions, social workers and so forth, uh, who are part of the state, to come in there and start, uh, you know, sort of breaking people up into the smallest possible units so they are as weak as possible uh, relative to the power of the concentrated state. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, Schlafly's point was, it's not that, you know, you can have rape and marriage and, and, and that that's fine. Rather, she said, you know, assault is already illegal. If a man is battering his wife, uh, there's already a criminal charge that can be raised about that. And, you know, so Schlafly was not, you know, defending the actual practice that, um, you know, the activists were saying they were against. She was saying, of course, that practice is wrong. What she was saying was that the way they were trying to structure the laws were, in fact, a way that was not going to solve the problem. It was a way that was simply going to expand the power of social workers. I want to tell you about your one-stop shop for all things CBD, and they've got a brand new website for you to check out, palomaverdecbd.com. And it's the Paloma Verde store, of course, owned by a great couple, Carlos and Vanessa, out of San Antonio, Texas. Carlos is a very bright young man. I can tell you why. Once you go to the new website, palomaverdecbd.com, you'll realize that he's smart enough to feature the better looking of the two on the brand new website. And you'll see what I mean once you go there. They've got everything you need as far as the world of CBD goes. You can explore their products on the new website page. You can see there, obviously they've got the tinctures, but they've got mint tinctures, they've got soft gels, they've got CBD gummies, multiple flavors of those, the salve stick, the sleep bundle, which I'm going to have to check out. I've not had the sleep bundle yet, but that sounds enticing to me. The menthol sports cream, I can tell you, works amazingly. I've used that multiple times. And one of the biggest fans I personally know of Paloma Verde CBD products is my French bulldog named Lux. He's about 10 years old now, which in dog years makes him like 70 or something, right? He's old and he gets around like a little old man with his back legs a little bit slower than they used to be until we started putting the CBD pet products that they have at Paloma Verde CBD. Com. We put it on his food every morning. They also have these dog treats that we give him. And it's amazing the job that the products have done for Lux, my French bulldog. Now he's trotting around like he's young again. He gets in and out of the doggy door with ease, which is a relief to me. I can tell you that. So, of course, I've got a promo code for you. It is BUCK, B-U-C-K. When you enter BUCK, the promo code at checkout, you get 25% off of all of your orders over $75, which is a bargain. That's over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com, their new website, promo code B-U-C-K, gets you 25% off all orders over $75. Let's get back to the show. Let's talk about uh, national populism, nationalism and populism, because that's, that's obviously in vogue, certainly uh, right now since the Trump years. Uh, we've got DeSantis kind of, it seems like, maybe carrying the torch. And I've been reading a book on, on this topic, and there's a lot of Steve Bannon in the book. And the author, I'm not sure how, how believable it is, at least in my mind, how he's doing this, but he's even tying Bannon back to some intellectuals like Julius Evola and people of that nature in this old tradition. Do you see some actual ties there or is this is this a bit of a reach is, is steve bannon reading some of these old old school traditionalists and, and passing this message on to people like donald trump i, I kind of want to get your feelings on on the trump movement the steve bannon influence and the populist moment at large i think bannon has certainly read uh, julia savola okay. and a number of other quite radical thinkers the traditionalism of Julius Evola has a capital T on it, and um, it is tied into a lot of philosophical ideas and religious ideas mm -hmm. that are quite strange by you know uh, most standards. 
So Julius Evola, you know, is a believer in a kind of perennial philosophy or a perennial uh, religion, an, an older, you know, sort of order that is, you know, antecedent to Christianity, antecedent to Islam. Mm-hmm. It is a kind of, um, you know, sort of ancient wisdom uh, that is uh, in some ways more mystical than historical. Um, so Evola is a figure who's, you know, sort of um, a little more marginal than some of what I'm going to talk about in my course okay. at Renegade University. But no, there are people reading him quite seriously. Evola is a serious critic of modernity. And I think that's one of the things that um, uh, Steve Bannon responds to. In terms of how you translate Evola and translate perhaps Bannonism into Trumpism, that mm-hmm. I think is a, um, it's not a one-to-one relationship, right? right? So people who think that, hey, if Steve Bannon reads Julius Evola and Steve Bannon talks to Donald Trump, Therefore, Donald Trump is somehow enacting uh, Julius Evola's uh, view of the world. Yes. Uh, no, that's that's rather oversimplifying. So first of all, Bannon himself is very eclectic. He reads a lot of things. He does his own thinking, and he comes up with uh, you know his own mixtures of ideas. And then second, Donald Trump is someone who responds oftentimes on instinct as opposed to uh, based on any kind of theory. So I don't think that you can say that the Trump movement is in some way uh, you know strongly influenced by a thinker like Julius Evola. The Trump movement is um, fundamentally, you know, like Trump himself, there is an instinct here. And it's an instinct that the American people are being screwed over and, uh, you know, tyrannized by, um, you know, uh, the establishment in both political parties, by, you know, the government, which is serving criminals better than it's serving law-abiding citizens and taxpayers. This was, by the way, one of the foundational points of agreement between the paleoconservatives and the paleo-libertarians back in the day. They said, wait a minute. Uh, You know, if you're a victim of a mugging uh, in the late 1980s, uh, that mugger may have more rights uh, in court than you do as a, you know, an innocent victim. And so, uh, you know, the term that someone like Sam Francis winds up using is a narco tyranny, Mm -hmm. that you have uh, anarchy, you know, in terms of uh, a lot of street crime, which can victimize uh, people who are law abiding. You also have tyranny in that you have a massive state, which is also against uh, the law abiding person. So you wind up with the worst of both worlds there. Does it feel like there's a? You said that the the Trump movement has some some similar excuse me similarities to the paleo conservative movement. Does it feel like there's possibly a right time currently for kind of a paleo libertarian alliance part two? I think so, and I think you already see that um, you know starting to form. There were. Uh, a variety of libertarian perspectives on Donald Trump, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were actually a variety of paleoconservative perspectives as well. Some paleoconservatives thought, hey, yeah, Donald Trump is better than the Bushes, but he's still, you know, more similar to them than not. Um, and then among libertarians, uh, I think there were uh, a number of grassroots libertarians. There were people like uh, perhaps a Thomas Massey in the U.S. Congress who has a lot of libertarian leanings who were quite accepting of Trump. Uh, Rand Paul was quite accepting of Trump. Um, who, you know, and then there were, I think, people in the grassroots who looked at Donald Trump and said, wait a minute, he ticks off the left, yes, you know, and he does a number of things on trade policy that we don't like. But in fact, um, you know, he's also um, certainly preventing certain kinds of foreign policy um, interventions that would otherwise be taking place on a grand scale. And uh, Donald Trump is also throwing into question things like the deep state and things like, you know, these intelligence agencies. And the, the fact that Trump is doing that and is questioning one of these most sacred, holy of holy institutions of the modern 21st century state, uh, that is one of the most important things that anyone can do. And if Trump is doing that, then it doesn't matter what other mistakes he might be making. He's, in fact, attacking one of the most dangerous anti-liberal, anti-libertarian forces uh, that exist within our society, and that is the deep state and the the national intelligence uh, community. Um, So, yeah, I think right now you see uh, some degree of recoalescing, um, on the other hand, I think you also see a lot of fragmentation. And uh, even among Trump supporters who are conservatives as opposed to libertarians, I think you see different strains of thought. Uh, some people are just, you know, sort of um, are just fanboys or fangirls who like Donald Trump as a personality but don't have any deeper political commitments. Some people are paleoconservatives who either are old, st- are old school paleoconservatives going back, you know, generations, or they're, you know, people who've just discovered these traditions uh, more recently. Um, And then you have other people who see Donald Trump as a chance to kind of kill off the old Reagan coalition and to create some some kind of new uh, politics on the right, which may in some respects actually resemble the compassionate conservatism of George W. Bush, 
more than it resembles the paleoconservatism of the 1990s. So those are the differences you see just among uh, the conservative supporters of Trump. And then I think among libertarian uh, elements who might be more favorable towards Trump, uh, there too, um, you know, you have hardline paleoconservatives, perhaps, you have more casual people, and uh, there may be other permutations out there too. Is there a natural tension between free market libertarianism and conservatism? Uh, up to a point, um, you know, politics, I mean, conservatism, you know, is generally not, uh, and not just generally, but overall is against the idea, again, of uh, simplifying and reducing all mm-hmm. of politics or all of life uh, to some single dimension or single principle. Um, to the extent that, you know, a uh, advocate of free markets wants to go all the way, it's not just a, a theoretical tension, but it's also a tension in terms of, well, how do you actually get there? How do you go through the steps of bringing about uh, this radical libertarian order? Someone like Walter Block, for example, was mm-hmm. always an outlier in this um, sort of paleo-libertarian, paleo-conservative alliance, because Walter Block was someone who still had certain left-wing commitments. And also Walter Block was someone who still liked the language of revolution, of having you know sort of libertarian revolutionary tribunals after the revolution and uh, you know, conservatives look at this and say, "Okay, that's that's both crazy, but also a bad idea in itself." <laughs> Having said that, um, I think there's actually less of a tension than you might imagine. I mean, the kind of society in which you can have libertarianism, in which you can have uh, the freedom that libertarians are devoted to, is a society which has developed uh, from uh, the things that conservatives are defending. Uh, basically, the kind of Western tradition that conservatives defend. And so I think libertarians, in fact, um, not only um, can exist within such an order, but maybe it's the only order in which libertarians can exist. And that, I think, Mm -hmm. is something that libertarians even now have to reflect upon and think very seriously about. Um, There are a lot of libertarians who don't want to believe that. They want to believe that, hey, we could have our radical individualism or radical property rights take root in Confucian China or perhaps in uh, Xi Jinping's China today or perhaps in the Islamic world. And the question is, is that true? Or, or do some of the, um, you know, sort of uh, social institutions and uh, moral perspectives that are encoded in these other civilizations actually pose a barrier to the kind of liberty that libertarians want? And do they? Well, that's, again, a question for libertarians to decide. I think mm-hmm. to a large extent, they probably do. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also not going to say that you need to write off Uh, non-Western civilizations. Mm -hmm. I would just say that that is an open question. It remains to be seen whether you could get a real, you know, sort of, uh, you know, effective social liberty within those kinds of uh, societies. Whereas we know that within the West, you more or less can have it. Um, So that's, you know, the fact that we've seen it work in one place means that it can work in that one place. Maybe it can work in other places too, but that is something that, you know, time will tell. There's been a law, a trend for many years, and I've, 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 unfortunately been a part of it at at points where libertarians say, look, I'm neither left nor right. I'm a libertarian. We only believe in the non-aggression principle. And lately, the last few years, there's been a sense of a lot of people in in my circles, at least, saying, you know what? I think that that's kind of untrue to to sit there and say we're neither left nor right throws off years and years and years of not only tradition and, and, and the way people just view real life. It's so theoretical to simply say we can live by the non-aggression principle and nothing else. You don't hurt people. You don't take their things. There's this start. There, there's starting to be people realizing that maybe, maybe I should fall somewhere on a spectrum of left or right. And maybe there's more to life than just the non-aggression principle. There's family. There's religion. And for the left libertarians, maybe there's a, an attempt at egalitarianism and and alternative lifestyles. And have you seen this come about? And what what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I do think that is something that libertarianism has to address um, time and time again, right? So right now is a perhaps moment of crisis or moment of reflection that is encouraging libertarians to do that. I think there've been other such moments like that in the past a century or so as well. Um, one of the things I would just say is that the non-aggression principle, while there are always going to be some people who are willing to um, you know, sort of take that up as their, their ethic in life, uh, there are always going to be a lot of people who don't and a lot of people who mm-hmm. feel very strongly invested in other human beings. Uh, there are always going to be busybodies. There are always going to be nosy people. There are also always going to be people who, you know, sort of are defining define themselves very much by their social relationships, even if they're not necessarily wanting to go around and boss people 
you know, say you do this, you do that. They nonetheless want to feel as if they're included in something where there really is an authority and a structure, um, whether that's coming from the state or coming from something else. And so one of the things that I think is a challenge for libertarianism is to say, what if human nature just isn't as agreeable to the non-aggression principle as we need it to be? That, you know, maybe some people are capable of and, you know, want to endorse the, the non-aggression principle, but what if most people don't? So how do you, you know, sort of get along with, with those people? And uh, that's where ideas like conservatism, I think it's where, you know, a lot of ideas on both the left and the right enter the picture. Mm -hmm. If you value liberty, then it's not just a matter of trying to make everyone agree with the thing that you believe in the most, but rather a question of what kind of negotiations are you going to enter into with people who may have a different schedule of values and a different uh, set of principles. Nonetheless, they could be either more or less harmful to you and what you're trying to do. And that this is a good segue, Daniel, because you, the first time I, I interviewed you, I asked you for book recommendations and the very first one you said is someone you've mentioned here uh, numerous times already was James Burnham. And you said you highly recommend The Machiavellians by James Burnham. At the time, man, it was hard to find. It was expensive <laughs> on Amazon. Since then, it's come out uh, in some kind of reissue edition or something like that. But I, it's for those listening, I would say if you're interested in political science and, and str strategy and, and the structures of power within politics, you have to read this book. What, what, let's talk about where he fits in in the conservative timeline and, and why he's so important. Yeah, um, James Burnham starts out as a, a brilliant young man. He is, uh, I think, from Chicago roots originally. He goes, he studies in England. He becomes uh, a... a um, not just a Trotskyist, but in fact, uh, he's someone who is seen by Leon Trotsky himself as uh, the best uh, Trotskyist theorist within America. But they do have certain differences, including about uh, the nature of the dialectic. And uh, James Burnham is less of a, you know, sort of uh, a political um, believer in these ab the power of abstractions, like the philosophical dialectic, mm -hmm. than Trotsky is. Um, and so one of the things that is characteristic of James Burnham's uh, thought, both in his early days and later on as he becomes more conservative, is this continuing reference back to real, real world power, as opposed to simply theoretical constructs like the you know, Hegelian or Marxist mm -hmm. dialectic. So um, Burnham becomes uh, disillusioned with Marx and disillusioned with Marx and with Trotsky, um, even before the, um, the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, in and what's critical about the Hitler-Stalin pact is obviously that's Stalin doing it, not Trotsky. But Trotsky wants to say this pact does not um, negate the value of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union may be a degenerate worker state. It may be under a tyrant like Joseph Stalin. But the, the, the Bolshevik Revolution was still a good idea. And the, the, the Soviet enterprise can still be rescued from Stalinism. Whereas James Burnham says, no, actually, Stalin is not the betrayal of Lenin. He's not the betrayal of the ideas of ideals of the revolution. Stalin is the fulfillment of the revolution. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what you would get based on what Lenin was doing, based on what other, other Bolsheviks and communists were doing. And so Burnham starts to completely change his points of view. He is still influenced by certain Marxist ideas about class and about uh, the importance of economic production uh, for the political order. But he is now looking for um, other ideas that can, uh, you know, sort of, uh, inform his view of the world. So if the Marxist idea that the world is a struggle between uh, capitalists and workers, and that it, then at the end of the at the end of history you get uh, the workers' state when the workers prevail, uh, if that's wrong, then how do you describe the world as it exists today? And Burnham said, well, you know what? The workers are not prevailing, but it's also not the case that the businessmen and the capitalists are prevailing either. So clearly something has happened that completely defies the Marxist structure of this, you know, sort of two-sided battle. And Burnham comes up with a theory that what's happened is a new class of people who are neither capitalists nor workers. Uh, they are what he calls the managers. And that includes, includes not only sort of certain kinds of executives within business, but it also includes um, government bureaucrats. It includes communist commissars. It includes uh, the kind of industrial officials that the Nazi party would put in charge of industry in, in Germany. James Burnham says, you know what, if you look at the New Deal, you look at Nazi Germany, you look at fascist Italy, and you look at the Soviet Union, and in fact, if you go back a little earlier and look at things that are happening as a result of World War I, if you look at changes within the business world as well as with changes within government, 
all across the board, you can see the rise of this new kind of person, this manager. So he comes up with this new theory. He publishes a book called The Managerial Revolution in 1941. And, um, you know, it's a huge success. It's very controversial. And uh, I think the next question he comes to is, hey, if I've correctly described the rise of this new, you know, class, this, this managerial class, and if this managerial class, you know, has this totalitarian tendency that you find not only in Nazi Germany and in the Soviet Union, but in a lot of aspects of what's happening in America, then what hope does freedom have, you know, in the future? And that's where the Machiavellians comes in. That's his second book in uh, 1943, 1944. And there he says that, uh, well, in fact, political liberty has always been a matter of conflict between elites. And it's when you have multiple elites within a society and you have conflict among them that you can then have a space for liberty created. And so even if you have the managerial revolution take place, as long as there are factions among the managers and as long as there is um, perhaps some residue of the pre-managerial order that still exists, then you could have enough uh, disruption that you could have some degree of liberty. And when he's looking at uh, the theory to support this, Burnham is turning to some very interesting thinkers. Uh, so one of them, for example, is the economist and sociologist Vilfredo Pareto, who has this brilliant multi-volume uh, work called The Mind and Society. Uh, and it is, it's profound. I mean, if you like James Burnham's Machiavelli, Machiavellians, you'll really love James, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, Vilfredo Pareto's uh, masterpiece. Pareto's interesting because he starts out as a classical liberal economist. And then he says, well, you know, classical liberalism and economics, these tell us about how people can rationally maximize whatever their, their values or their, um, uh, their uh, you know, sort of uh, desire for goods might be. But obviously, there's a lot of irrational um, uh, aspects to human life as well. And that's what leads uh, uh, Pareto to go from studying economics to studying sociology and politics. And he says, aha, we can see that uh, irrationality is actually the major component of human activity. Um, so Pareto is someone that James Burnham starts to recover. So is um, someone like George Sorel, who is, a, uh, again, a kind of renegade Marxist who has uh, views that a lot of the French hard right also uh, kind of adopts. Uh, Sorel is a syndicalist as opposed to a, uh, you know, a garden variety communist. And Sorel uh, promotes this idea of the myth. The myth is something that, you know, sort of unifies some class or group of people uh, against a power structure. So the general strike is a myth that you find on the left. Uh, Sorel is an interesting figure. He has a book um, called Reflections on Violence, which is uh, quite radical, quite bracing and, and, a, and a good read. Um, there are others too, like Gaetano Mosca, who is, you know, a theorist of political power. He's kind of similar in some ways to uh, Pareto. And uh, so Burnham, you know, is someone who goes back and looks at these power politics theorists from the late 19th and early 20th century. And what makes the Machiavellian so valuable as a book is that it, you know, incorporates the thought from all of these other figures. Then after that, Mach uh, sorry, uh, Burnham goes on and becomes a, uh, a cold warrior. He's someone who advises the CIA during, and the OSS, during World War II and the early... Um, uh, the early part of the Cold War. He's someone who's even involved uh, in the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran. He's been, you know, mixed up in some of the planning involved in that. Uh, and similarly in uh, you know, various forms of CIA skullduggery in Latin America as well. So he is a, someone who wants to practice you know, a, a pretty uh, tough-minded kind of politics uh, you know, in, in government as well as outside of it. He winds up breaking with the CIA in part because the CIA starts to embrace uh, the non-communist left, the, the CIA becomes, you know, as it is now, just as the CIA now embraces yeah. transgenderism, uh, back in even the 1950s, the CIA was starting to embrace the idea of, you know, sort of democratic socialism or democratic capitalism in conjunction with democratic socialism uh, and starting to become, you know, um, very kind of uh, part of the, the you know, left-wing establishment and the CIA establishment were starting to merge. And Burnham was too, you know, idiosyncratic and in some ways too right-wing to be incorporated into that. Um, so Burnham then writes a series of books uh, about the Cold War, things like The Coming Defeat of Communism. Uh, you know, those books are also very interesting. Um, you know, if you want to see like a serious case for Cold War conservatism uh, that is not based on a lot of just idealistic uh, falderall, but is actually about the balance of power, those books are quite um uh, valuable. And it's not that I'm, you know, going to endorse everything in them, but I think um, he does make a very substantial intellectual criticism of people like George Kennan, for example, who has the containment strategy instead of a strategy of, you know, sort of rolling back and defeating communism. 
Um, so Burnham, you know, has these various different aspects. There's the ex-Marxist, the theorist of the managerial revolution. There is the Machiavellian, and then there is the Cold Warrior. And because the Cold Warrior is the last phase of, of Burnham, uh, people tend to, um, you know, by the end, by the time uh, Burnham dies in 1987 or so, um, that's you know kind of the light in which they see him. They tend mm -hmm. to look at these older ideas as having been eclipsed by uh, historical events. But I think more recently, uh, starting in the 1990s, you had people like Sam Francis begin to re-examine Burnham and say, wait a minute, a lot of things Burnham was saying about the managerial revolution have actually come true. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what Burnham says about the nature of politics and the Machiavellians has been true all along. And so you have a sort of renaissance of Burnhamite thinking starting in the 1980s and continuing through to today. Uh, Burnham's a fascinating figure. I'll go into him in depth in uh, the course I'll be teaching for Renegade University. And uh, so I'll kind of just tantalize uh, audiences with uh, that snippet so far. Yes, he is fascinating. And do you, do you think there's a natural imbalance, let's say, a, of power between conservatives and progressives or the right and the left when there's one side that's clearly trying to grab power and that's what their, their interests are, is to be gain power, have it over the other half of the country. And you have conservatives who largely oftentimes want to just be left alone and aren't so worried about controlling uh, the structures of power. Do we, does the right need a Machiavellian type figure to, to kind of lead them who's interested in like, look, I, I want to gain power. I'm gaining it for you guys. It seems like Trump had that a little bit. Does the right need someone like that? Well, the point you've brought up uh, goes right back to Machiavelli himself. And in fact, this is something that is discussed uh, in The Prince. Um, in the 24th chapter of The Prince, uh, Machiavelli has a very, very interesting uh, set of uh, observations. He's just spent you know, the, uh, the previous 23 chapters uh, basically giving advice. And you would think, okay, so someone who takes his advice can therefore succeed. But what Machiavelli says in the 24th chapter of The Prince is, in fact, um, people have certain intrinsic characters and they have certain experiences in their lives. And these things are going to prevent them from acting the way they have to act. Um, that some people are prudent and therefore when a time for boldness arises, they're not going to be bold enough. And some people are naturally bold and therefore when a time requires prudence, they're not going to be able to be prudent enough. And similarly, if you're someone who in your experience has always succeeded by being entrepreneurial and bold or someone who's always succeeded by being prudent and cautious, uh, if the circumstances change, you're going to look at your experience and say, hey, wait a minute, what's always worked before is going to work for me in the future. And you might, might wind up being, you know, sort of destroyed at that point. So it's kind of interesting because then you wonder, well, what is, what is Machiavelli advising if you can't wind up, you know, choosing one direction or the other? And uh, this is where a very close and careful reading of Machiavelli, both in The Prince and also in his other great work, uh, Discourses on the uh, First uh, Ten Books of Titus Livy, uh, both of these works need to be read together because the answer in part is that a republic can supply the things that a monarchy can't. With a monarchy, you're stuck with the character of the monarch, and it's very hard. There are things he can do to help, you know, sort of balance his own character, but in general, his own character is going to be the defining thing. Whereas with a republic, you have a large selection of potential leaders, and you can choose the kind of leader you need for the circumstances that are right in front of you. Machiavelli also says at the end of the 24th chapter of The Prince that uh, fortune, fortune is a woman, and she likes to be seduced, and she likes, you know, guys who come on strong. And so he says, uh, what kind of men does Fortune like as a woman? Uh, she likes young men, and she likes, you know, sort of tough, rash men, uh, bold men. And so Machiavelli is saying you need to have, uh, you know, if you want to overcome Fortune and the vicissitudes you can't predict, you need to have a boldness of character, and probably you need to be a young person. And so you look at the right, and this is in fact ties in with a, a talk I'm going to give um, a few days after we record this podcast, but I'm giving a talk uh, to a group in, uh, you know, here in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to say one of the problems with a lot of conservatives is that we are too conservative. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, we're intellectuals. We're people who like to defend the way things are. Uh, we don't like to disrupt our own lives. And therefore, when an emergency arises, what can we do? We need to counterbalance our own character by bringing in someone who has a character that is opposite to ours, mm -hmm. someone who is bold where we are cautious, someone who is willing to kick over the tables where we want to, you know, sort of keep the chessboard as it is. And so that's why we need someone like Donald Trump. He has exactly those complementary characteristics uh, that we need. And Donald Trump himself is not a young man, but I think it's very interesting the way in which a lot of American, young Americans have responded to Donald Trump. And you certainly see on the young right that young people are overwhelmingly 
favorably inclined towards Donald Trump, at least, you know, the ones who are, you know, sort of want to get engaged in a, a kind of rough and tumble politics. You have others who are, you know, sort of young careerists who don't like Donald Trump at all. But I think you find all the most talented and energetic young people are very much uh, excited by Donald Trump. So, um, you know, one of the key things about Burnham uh, is also that um, you go back to Machiavelli himself and you find that Machiavelli, uh, way back in the 16th century, had a lot of perspectives that are quite valuable to us uh, even now. This has been awesome. I, I, I could go on and on. I've, I've got pages and pages of notes to ask you, so, but, and I got to respect your time. And, and we got to leave people wanting uh, more. But, but before we get out of here, what are your thoughts on DeSantis? You know, I people ask me all the time, who do you think is going to win the Republican nomination? Of course, we're it's it's 2021. Next week, we could have something insane happen. So there's no telling. But I, I often see uh, Tucker Carlson, and I just have this gut feeling that he's going to be the guy. I don't know why. Clearly, Ron DeSantis seems to be the leader right now. He seems to be a leader versus someone like my governor, Greg Abbott, who's kind of... Uh, does what DeSantis does about a month later. What, what does Ron DeSantis represent to you right now for the right, for the conservative movement in this country? Something that impressed me about Ron DeSantis was earlier this year, I was at an event, uh, which was primarily an event full of donors to you know mainstream conservative institutions. Uh, and Ron DeSantis was one of the people who spoke to this audience. Now, most politicians who speak to an audience like that are going to tailor their remarks to what the audience wants to hear. Mm -hmm. And if you're speaking to donors, especially older donors to, you know, a long-established conservative organization, uh, you, go, you think that they want to hear, you know, a bunch of Reaganism. Maybe they want to hear some Bush-style neoconservatism. You know, you, wanna, you, you might think they want to hear the Nikki Haley message. Mm -hmm. And Ron DeSantis, in fact, uh, gave the pure Trump message, although he did it in his own way. Mm -hmm. So DeSantis was willing to talk about uh, trade deals in a way that Donald Trump would do. He was also willing to talk about um, staying out of foreign interventions. And that really struck me because this was an audience where, you know, foreign policy was not their main thing. And if anything, some of them might have traditionally been in favor of a more activist Bush style foreign policy. And DeSantis was willing to challenge them. He was willing to say, actually, Donald Trump was completely right about our need to stay out of Middle East conflicts. Mm. So the fact that DeSantis was willing to say these things to an audience which didn't necessarily, you know, primarily want to hear them. I mean, the audience was willing to tolerate them, but it was not, you know, the audience you would expect to be favorable towards these views. Um, gave me uh, a lot of respect for DeSantis. It's not that I think DeSantis is, you know, Ron Paul or is Pat Buchanan or is even Donald Trump, but I think Ron DeSantis is a very competent guy. I think he is generally, you know, in the right, uh, on the right direction of things, you know, including on things like foreign policy, on things like trade, on immigration. I think he's quite solid. And so, you know, uh, DeSantis will be in some ways less radical perhaps than Donald Trump, but he might be more effective for being you know, kind of less uh, explosive on Twitter, but being much more results oriented. And I really like what DeSantis has done in terms of never shutting down Florida entirely, uh, mm -hmm. reopening as soon as possible, and questioning the whole lockdown mentality, which obviously is the greatest infringement on liberty that has happened, you know, since the beginning of the war on terror. So DeSantis is someone I have, you know, pretty good feelings about. It's not that I look to him as, you know, being the ideal politician or anything like that, uh, but I do think that he's uh, better than any of the other Republicans out there right now and obviously way better than Harris and uh, Biden and whatever else the Democratic Party might throw up. Yeah, like that, that's a low bar there, though. So uh, book suggestions. I ask you this every time because uh, for those watching on YouTube, look behind, uh, Daniel, and you can see why I'm asking this. Just a couple of book suggestions that would roll off your mind. Well, let's see. Um, Part of the problem with having the library that you see behind mm. me <laughs> is that it's hard to know where to start. <laughs> and in my uh, you know, uh, course for Renegade University, uh, book selections will be a big part of it. And you know, there'll be some optional readings and things that people can uh, um, glom onto. Um, I'm a big believer in some of these texts that you would um, think are just old and boring, right? So I was talking about Machiavelli's uh, Prince just a few minutes ago. Um, I always find whenever I revisit the prints or uh, the discourses that I learn something new. And one of the great things about Mac uh, uh, James Burnham's Machiavellians is that it kind of incentivizes you to go back and look at these other texts. I'd actually say that um, Leo Strauss's book on Machiavelli, Thoughts on Machiavelli, is also quite good. And uh, maybe read that after you read uh, James Burnham on Machiavelli. Um, uh, Edmund Burke, who's going to be a figure I talk about mm -hmm. quite a bit, 
you know, he's writing in a, an 18th century style, which a lot of contemporary Americans today are simply not going to find very um, easily accessible. Nevertheless, uh, I do highly recommend, um, first of all, there's a, a Penguin Classics collection of Edmund Burke's pre-revolutionary writings. You want to you read that. Um, it's, it's fascinating. A lot of people only think about Edmund Burke and his connection with the French Revolution. But in fact, uh, I think a lot of uh, listeners to this podcast in particular will be very interested in Edmund Burke's very first published work uh, for a large audience, which was called A Vindication of Natural Society, which is both a parody but also an interesting philosophical commentary on anarchism. Mm. So that's something that people you know, might not expect to find uh, mm -hmm. in Edmund Burke. His second uh, major work is um, an essay on the uh, nature of the sublime and the beautiful, which I'm going to talk about a lot in my course. And this will strike many people as just weird. You know, he's talking about aesthetics. He's talking about beauty. What does this have to do about politics? But in fact, it talks about the irrational element of humanity, which is then going to be absolutely essential for understanding politics later on when you get to things like Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. And that, of course, is the, the book that, you know, if people read any Edmund Burke, they typically just read the Reflections on the Revolution in France. But I actually think you need to read the Revol Reflections on the Revolution in light of these earlier uh, works. And so there's a Penguin Classics collection of his pre-revolutionary writings that I think is excellent. Uh, there are lots of collections, there are lots of editions of Reflections on the Revolutions in, in France, which uh, are, are well worth picking up. There's also a, a late uh, Edmund Burke essay called uh, Thoughts and Details on Scarcity, which I think libertarian members of the audience will really enjoy, because Edmund Burke says in there that the laws of economics are the laws of God. And uh, it's kind of a startling, you know, seemingly radical libertarian thing for Edmund Burke to say. So you want to read that essay as well and kind of think about it in light of these other more traditionalist elements in Burke's thought. Um, there's so much else which is going to be covered uh, in my course. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked a bit about paleoconservatives. Um, just as you found that um, James Burnham's books commanded a high price until they were brought yes. out in cheap editions just recently, I think you'll find that Sam Francis's books, things like mm -hmm. Beautiful Losers, yes. are also going for hundreds of dollars at this point. Um, probably there will be a re reissue of uh, some of those books um, before long, but who can say? Um, any number of uh, things like that are really good, but are also going to be uh, difficult to pick up. Leviathan and its enemies. Is Leviathan it, is and, it, and its enemies was a huge book that uh, Sam Francis wrote, but did not publish during his mm -hmm. lifetime. And um, it, you can kind of see why. I mean, one of the things about Francis is that he was a very um, meticulous writer. He had a great literary style. And there's a lot of kind of subtle humor in his books. There's a lot of development mm -hmm. in them. Uh, whereas Leviathan and its enemies is just a heavy sort of, it's not quite a textbook, but it's this very heavy, yeah. you know, sort of treatise that is not as you know, sort of well-refined as uh, Francis's other essays. Now, you know, I'll talk in my my uh, course about, you know, there are lots of things I disagree with with Francis. I mean, Francis really was something pretty much like a white nationalist in the end. And, uh, you know, I think racial politics is just stupid. But uh, but Francis has a lot of brilliant insights into politics in general that are not connected to his racial views. And so um, I do recommend uh, that readers check him out. They'll really find that they'll be shocked to see things he was writing in the early 90s uh, seem to anticipate a lot of what's been happening uh, in the uh, you know 2010s and 2020s now. Yes, I'm going to link to a bunch of this stuff in the show notes page. Of course, I'll link to this course. Uh, that Daniel's teaching in the show notes page for this episode as well. And also, as we leave this episode, you have the best name on Twitter. You might as well pitch that as well. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter at Tory Anarchist. There you go. Daniel McCarthy, thanks so much for being here with us on Counterflow, and I am stoked for this class. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, I hope you enjoyed that conversation, and I hope to see you guys in the class that uh, Daniel McCarthy is putting on over at Renegade University. I can tell you this, I will put a link to it in the show notes page for this episode. You can just click on that and it'll get you to the site where you can purchase your entry fee into the class on conservatism. Five part webinar. It's going to be really cool. And I hope to see you guys there. I also want to tell you about my friend Mark Metz, his Substack. You guys are familiar with that platform now? The Emergent. If some of the topics you heard here today are of interest to you and you're a libertarian, well, the emergent kind of combines what we discussed today with some libertarianism. It's a kind of a paleo libertarian newsletter, we can call it. I guess you can call those a newsletter. It's like a weekly 
article, basically, that Mark Metz puts out. You can find that at markmetz, M-A-R-K-M-E-T-Z dot substack dot com. It's free, of course. Our YouTube page, like I said, get those numbers up. We're finally putting a lot of love into the page, and it'd be nice to see some of you guys love it back. Subscribe to it. Leave us a review and subscribe on iTunes if that's the platform that you use. The website is running strong. You guys are ordering shirts. It's nice. On the website, counterflowpodcast.com, not only do we have brand new Counterflow t-shirts with, uh, I don't want to brag, but the, uh, the aesthetic is quite nice. We've got old school Death to Tyrants shirts on there at a discount, only $10. You can, there's a few left. There's a few Death to Tyrant shirts left. Get you one before they are gone. And I will see you guys in the classroom, Renegade University on Daniel McCarthy's class on conservatism. See you there. You get split in fucking half, cause I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. This has been the Counterflow Podcast, a part of the Renegade Media Network.